Hello, and welcome to a special pre-recorded SETI Live. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, Communications Specialist at the SETI Institute. Due to some scheduling restrictions for our guests today, we are not live streaming this interview, but please let us know in the comments on both Facebook and YouTube where you are watching from. Also, feel free to ask questions in the comments, and we will do our best to get them answered. Joining me now are our very own Dr. Pascal Lee and two of his summer interns, Sophie English and Cody Johnson. Thank you everyone for joining me today. Welcome, say hi everybody. <laughs> Hello. Uh, hi everyone. This, uh, introduction. Uh, so, so um, Pascal, I understand that this team is following up on the work done by two previous interns, uh, Eric Pimentel and Charlie Willard from last year, who were working to identify two dozen candidate sites or so for NASA's future Artemis Base Camp um, at the South Pole of the Moon. And Sophie and Cody are more closely examining some three of these most promising candidates. Why don't you give us a, a little intro and background on, on what the research is? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, we, we're we going to talk in turn here, but I wanted to give you some uh, some background from the work last year, but also some context for for why NASA is even considering an Artemis base camp. Uh, bear in mind, though, uh, our results presented today are preliminary. This will be properly published uh, when when we, we are actually done with the study. Uh, but what I show here in the background is a scene from 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, courtesy a 20th Century Fox, and of course, this is not what NASA has in mind as the Artemis Base Camp. This is, you know, Alpha <laughs> on the Moon. Uh, but uh, the idea is that you want to have a base in a place that is sort of wide open, easy to land at, that has potential for expansion, even if you start small. Uh, and a base is precisely what, what precisely that. It's it's where you then concentrate a number of your logistical operations, uh, and then to 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 access the the science rich targets that are on the moon you then equip your base with a mobility system you you travel to those places so if you remember in that movie uh, you would take that uh, uh, bus school bus shaped uh, shuttle to get to you know interesting locations including where that stone was but anyway uh, you don't necessarily have to build a base where the action is where the science is uh, what you need to have is a, a place that's safe for your base Mm -hmm. uh, easy to access uh, and then uh, easy to operate from and then access your other locations by through mobility systems. So uh, here are some lessons that we know from base for building a base or from the earth. Um, this is building in part uh, on my personal experience. These are actually all the places in Antarctica where I've spent some time, including at uh, Dumont Durville station where uh, I spent a year at a at a base. Uh, the red dots are large bases that are operated by either different nations or uh, uh, actually a private uh, outfit called, called um, Adventure Network International, but the Chileans also have a base at, uh, at Patriot Hills. Uh, and then the, the yellow dots are more temporary camps uh, that I either set up at the time with, with colleagues when we were uh, doing field work down there. Uh, or existing temporary camps that we joined in and, and did some work at. So the point is there's base and base. There are things that are really large logistical hubs and then places that you can set up as a temporary outpost for science and then you move on if uh, once you're done with those locations. Uh, so this is the French base. Uh, we were 31 uh, guys wintering over there at the time. Uh, and I can show you where my little bedroom was, where our office was. Uh, but essentially, you can see that it's a cluster. They were close enough uh, spatially so that you could uh, walk easily from one building to the next without having to, you know, uh, sort of turn that into a whole EVA to go from one building to another. But on the other hand, it was still far enough apart so that if there was a fire, for example, in one building, it wouldn't spread uh, easily to the next. So, so there's a there's a logic to the positioning of these buildings the way they were. Uh, and then, of course, this is the mobility system that that base had, ships to get around uh, between the islands in the summer, helicopters uh, also used in the summer for short hops, short hops. Uh, otherwise, rovers, including these weasels from World War II that were reconverted into polar vehicles, 
these, these tractor vehicles were used uh, for to go onto the ice cap. Uh, McMurdo is a bigger example of this. It's a, it's a fixed infrastructure. It's a, you know, in the, the summer population at McMurdo uh, used to be of order a thousand people. Uh, and then of course, in the winter, there are a few hundred winter over there, but this is the United States' biggest uh, in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And it is close to things that are of scientific interest, of course, but the vast majority of the science work that is done from McMurdo is actually away from the base, uh, where you have to use either a helicopter or some mobility system to get to, including when we go collect meteorites, for example, here, uh, we had to set up a, a remote camp for a few weeks in this location and then roam around locally. Okay, so this is a temporary outpost, if you will, compared to McMurdo. But again, you use large airplanes to go to far away sites on the continent of Antarctica. You use twin otters for shorter hops. You use tracked vehicles if you have, uh, if, if things are accessible over land. And then you use snowmobiles for short hops to, to places of interest. There are also helicopters, of course, to get you to places like the dry valleys, which if you had to drive there would be a real detour. Uh, flying there by helicopter is the best way to get there. Uh, so in the Arctic, uh, I've actually had a chance with my colleagues to also set up a base from scratch. And so I have some experience that we've tried to put to bear here in, in our decision making process for, for how and where we would set up a, a, a good base for, for the Artemis program on the moon. And so I'm going to take you now to Devon Island. This is now in the Arctic, not Antarctica. It's the, near the North Pole. Devon Island is the largest uninhabited island on Earth. Uh, it has a large meteorite impact crater. That's sort of the prime uh, scientific attraction for us, Houghton Crater. Uh, and we have a base there right on the rim of Houghton Crater. Here it is. This is Houghton Crater's, you can recognize the bullseye in the landscape in the middle of this scene. This is Houghton Crater seen from about 10,000 feet of altitude. And our base is set up on the northwestern rim of, of Houghton Crater. So we're looking north, and you can see our HMP, Houghton Mars Project Research Station, uh, indicated by the arrow. Uh, this is a you know, local topographic map. The, the dotted arc, arc line that runs across this uh, map is the northwestern rim of Houghton Crater. Uh, and the yellow dot uh, is the Houghton Mars Project Research Station. We also have an airstrip. So that's sort of the, the landing pad, if you will, for our camp. Uh, it's some distance away, and it's also not directly down the path of landing or takeoff, taking off planes. Of course, you don't want, you want to minimize the risk of an accident turning an even greater catastrophe if the plane uh, crashes into the base. Uh, so there are some precautions you have to take to sort of separate your habitat area from your from your launch pad area, if you will, or your landing pad area. Uh, and uh, every square here, just to give you a sense of scale, is, is on this grid is a one kilometer on its side. Right now, this is sort of the layout of our camp. You can see the airstrip at the upper left. Uh, we created trails to connect our habitat area to the uh, airstrip. Uh, this particular trail we call NASA Road One. Those of you who live in Houston uh, or have visited the Johnson Space Center might find this uh, humorous. Uh, we also set up the uh, infrastructure that serves both the camp and the airstrip, uh, like fuel depots, uh, fuel caches, and other landing things like the helipad at the, at the airstrip. Okay, we fly out all our waste from camp, and so this is also why we have the waste processing facility near the airstrip rather than at camp. You know, why, why have your waste processing at camp if you go out eventually anyway? Mm -hmm. So we take it to the airstrip, to the pad area, if you will, uh, to, to process, and then it's ready for, for pickup to be loaded onto the planes. Uh, and our camp itself is also a series of solid or fabric structures, uh, vinyl tent structures. There are also some solid buildings among these. Uh, the intent for us was to actually connect all these, but we're still uh, trying to raise funds for that uh, final touch in connecting all these modules. But the idea of the other Antarctic bases that you saw is, is still there. You have separate buildings, each having a specific function, sometimes several functions, uh, and they are 
not completely built uh, right next to each other so that in case there's a fire, uh, there's, there's a limited chance for it to spread immediately to all the other buildings. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't want them to be too far apart so that, you know, every uh, walk across between two buildings turns into uh, an EVA, okay, uh, a spacewalk. So you don't want that. You want that to be. So presumably on the moon, what we would have is a number of modules that would be set up. Uh, modules, I think, are a good idea. They can be moved over time. You can reconfigure them. Uh, uh, to protect yourself from radiation, uh, you can bury them under sandbags or bags of regolith of lunar soil. Uh, obviously, we don't have to do this in the Arctic. Uh, and on the moon, of course, these modules would be connected. You know, they'd be pressurized. But you might still want to have some distance between them so that you can sort of seal one module off from the others if, if necessary, just like on the space station. So this is our camp in the winter, uh, just uh, some couple of pretty pictures. Uh, we have not done a winter over at this location yet, but uh, I think there's interest at NASA to start doing those kinds of things at places like analogs. And around our base on Devon Island, we've also drawn uh, a la NASA the, these exploration zones. So the solid red circle is 100 kilometers out, the second red circle uh, in, in dotted lines is 200 kilometers out from camp. And these represent areas that, you know, in which we identify then targets of interest, TOIs, which can be uh, regions of interest or really specific uh, targets. Uh, and uh, they can be of interest for science or they can be of interest for resources as well. Okay, so there are different targets of interest. Uh, same idea, we have a mobility system to, that allows us to roam the whole island. When we are there, we have twin otter airplanes that we can uh, charter, uh, helicopters that we can fly, um, Humvees that serve as pressurized rover simulators, side-by-sides, ATVs. Uh, and I'm going to skip through this, but just to show you, well, just to show you very quickly that to get to a target of interest, like a rocky outcrop to collect a sample, there's a real process. You land on Devon Island, first of all. You, you then use a pressurized rover to get to your area of interest. Then the pressurized rover in our concept of operations is actually accompanied by robotic ATVs. Once you get to your area of interest, you hop onto a robotic ATV, which you can now drive. Uh, and of course, by now you are in a spacesuit you carried your spacesuit with your pressurized rovers and you do the final distance to to your rocky outcrop where you out, ultimately collect your sample okay so this stepwise approach to your rock sample uh, is illustrated here but the scenario would be the same on the moon we'd leave a base go out and pressurize rovers hopefully we'll have local atvs for local unpressurized mobility and then get to the places we want to sample and then come back with a treasure trove so where should we set up the Artemis base camp for NASA? Uh, my most candid personal advice to NASA, actually, uh, if I was ever asked, uh, is to not set up a base at the South Pole. It's a very difficult terrain. The lighting is complicated. The, there's a lot of shadowing going on. Uh, the terrain is really rough. The slopes are, you know, uh, very difficult to manage compared to the Mare areas where Apollo mostly landed and where the terrain was was a lot flatter. Uh, you're asking for trouble in some sense to set up a base as your logistical hub uh, if you want it to be uh, in the South Polar region. I mean, the South Polar region is attractive to, to NASA and other agencies because we know that there's water ice there and there's water possibly in other forms as well in the regolith. Uh, so we want to be close to, to a substance which may or may not be you know, an exploitable resource from an economic standpoint, uh, we still don't know. Uh, but having said that, the idea is to be near your, your source, your, your potential resource. But still, I think uh, for a base, uh, one might be better off to set it up in a place that's a lot more benign, easy to, to access, to, to explore around, uh, to, to operate from and operate at, uh, and then set up outposts temporary outposts to explore this or that other region of the moon that we are particularly interested in, uh, including the South Polar regions, uh, determine really where there is water to be uh, had and extracted, 
And then at that point, set up maybe a second generation outpost or even a mining camp, okay, to, to get that water. But that's, that's not something you do up front when we know that to really have uh, the, the ability to explore the moon properly, we actually need a base before we are likely to know exactly where we'll find the water. Okay, so I mean, that's my uh, 10 cents worth on this. But if we really needed to set up a base at the south polar region of the moon, where would it be? So uh, here are locations where uh, hydrogen has been detected in the lunar polar region. You can see that the concentrations of it, uh, especially near the lunar south pole, but the north pole has concentrations too. Every one of these light blue colored areas is hydrogen rich. We interpret that as most likely uh, water ice rich, although it could also be hydrated minerals in the, in the regolith of the moon. And so we want to be close to this source of, of, of water. And water, of course, is not only important for us as a uh, for our subsistence. Uh, we need water for hydration. Uh, but it's, of course, critical uh, as, a, as a potential source of rocket fuel because you can split the H2O molecule into hydrogen and oxygen. And then hydrogen and oxygen, when combined properly, are, are essentially combustible and rocket fuel. So, so having being close to water will give you, of course, a lot of advantages if you can extract it economically, which is a, actually a big if. Uh, so NASA is already showing some concepts where you know uh, a number of assets are positioned on the surface, pressurized rovers, fixed habitats, people going out on EVAs to do science and other things. Uh, a solar panel in the distance there, powering uh, uh, maybe a, uh, a, a power station or um, a comms facility, a communications uh, facility. And you can see that there are also pressurized rovers, but also um, uh, unpressurized rovers in the mix. Okay, So the idea is there. You have the fixed base elements and the mobility system. Uh, all we're saying is that we should also have a hopper, a lunar flyer that gets you from A to B sort of over long distances. The C-130, if you will, of the moon is what we really want so that you can set up your base somewhere really more benign and come explore this place if you really need to. Anyway, the South Pole uh, is at the intersection of these crosshairs. And the scale here is given to you uh, at the lower right. Shackleton Crater is almost uh, smack on the South Pole. I mean, the South Pole is actually a little bit off of it. Shackleton Crater is about the size of Helton Crater. It's 20 kilometers in diameter, and Washington, D.C. would fit in it. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's dark, cold, dreary. Uh, you know, Sounds like a perfect home. Hostile, and, and so <laughs> is Shackleton. <laughs> All right. Well, well played, Pascal. Well played. Okay. <laughs> in any case, uh, here is here are the criteria that we applied last summer with uh, my two great interns that summer, which were who were uh, Aaron Pimentel, who's from Hamilton College, and Charlie Willard, who was at the University of Chicago. And so we had the following criteria, which we applied in order. First of all, you have to have power. Solar illumination has to uh, be present, usable in, in sufficient quantity. We're not thinking of going nuclear on the moon quite yet. So we need to go solar. Uh, second, uh, we need to be able to communicate with the Earth directly, at least parts of the year. This is really important in my view. Uh, not everybody will agree with that, but if you're counting only on orbital assets to communicate with the Earth, what if those go down? You know, now you're completely cut off from the Earth. So it's a good idea to be able to at least see the Earth from where you are set up as a, as a base, uh, you know, so that you can have direct to Earth communications, DTE. Then you want a habitat area that is relatively flat so that you can lay out your, your modules, okay? Uh, then you have, uh, you need a landing pad, launch pad area, which has to be away from the habitat area because you, otherwise you're gonna sandblast with your rocket exhaust, your habitats to, to, to death. And so uh, we establish a minimum distance of about one to two and a half kilometers to three kilometers uh, away from our habitat as a, as a good minimum distance. And on top of that, we want a difference in elevation between the two of about 100 meters. Either that or there's some sort of a topographic obstacle, like a little hill between the two, to shield the habitat area from the landing launch pad area. 
then we are going to look into what are the science options at all these different sites and you focus on logistics first because that goes to the heart of your survival and access then you look at among all the options we then have which are the ones that give you the best science access so so then we look at the proximity to water ice bearing psrs permanently shadowed regions and proximity uh, to the south pole <clears throat> aiken basin which is this large impact basin sophia will talk to you about it later uh, in the mostly on the far side of the moon uh, where it was so large uh, and at the same time so ancient that we think that it would have uh, brought to the surface of the moon and scattered around it bits and pieces of the lunar mantle of the early lunar mantle and that would be really interesting because now we could really tell how the moon was made uh, and how it evolved over time okay so uh, the South Pole Econ Basin material is sort of uh, among the holy grail materials to sample on the moon for, for the Artemis program. Anyway, solar illumination, uh, we narrow down the options to uh, a number of sites if we require the illumination to be at least 65% of the time. And that's because uh, as the moon rotates, okay, the sun's going to travel across the sky, but the sun rays are so grazing that if you have hills, and mountains, there are places where you're not going to see the sun for, for days at a time, if not uh, weeks. Uh, and so, and then sometimes not at all. So we need a place that has at least uh, solar illumination for more than 65% of the time. Uh, and, and so then that, uh, that uh, led to the identification of a, of a number of sites. Sometimes they're clustered, okay, where you have this threshold that is met <clears throat> often just at the scale of one or two pixels. Okay, but then around these areas, around these, these, these uh, good solar illumination uh, pixels, we draw 2.5 kilometer radii, which is then becomes defined as your site. Then we look at the, uh, among these places, what does the direct to earth visibility look like? And we want the direct to earth visibility to be at least 50% of the time. Uh, and even if you see the Earth at some times, I mean, the Moon, as we know, always keeps the same side, you know, facing the Earth. But even if you if you see the Earth at some times, the Moon also librates; it sort of wobbles, and so it's possible that a hail will all of a sudden get in the way of of the Earth, you know, at some times of the year, and then uh, you would not see the Earth at all times. So we want the Earth to be visible more than fifty percent of the time. Is sort of the criterion here. Then you realize that uh, if you plot these two criteria we've used so far, uh, only a subset of these dots uh, will display good direct to earth visibility over 50%. And on top of that, uh, among the solar illumination options, there are some that are above 70%, 75%, which is really what you want. Okay, so the green dots are the prime uh, candidates up to this point. Then we look at HAB area. You want slopes that are less than five degrees to build a HAB. You want an area that is more or less continuously at least one kilometer square in area so that you have options to expand your HAB, your HAB area, your, your habitat, uh, your base. And of course, uh, your HAB area should be close to the point of solar maximum illumination. And so here are three examples where only one at the top, the one at the top is, is fitting the bill. The other have too limited a, a HAB area, uh, either in, in aerial coverage or in, um, in continuity, okay? Uh, and so uh, in spite of, for example, Shackleton Rim, which was considered uh, for the, during the Constellation program, uh, mainly because it was so close to the South Pole itself, is actually not a very good place because with a, there's not a lot of flat areas that are continuous for you to set up your base. Uh, then you want your pad area to be not too close to your habitat. So again, either separated by a little hill, like shown here in this uh, painting I did of Mars, actually, but same idea. Uh, or um, or you want the elevation difference between the two sites to be more than 100 meters. And so this narrow things down a little more. Uh, so on the right here, I'm showing we're showing an example where. Uh, you can see the 2.5 kilometer circle, part of it around a maximum illumination point. And here there are three options for the pad area, the 
red direction, the green one, and the blue one. They, they all point to a little patch of pink. That patch of pink is a flat, you know, uh, in and of itself viable landing pad area. But not all of these are going to fit the bill of either having an obstacle separating them from the habitat area or uh, an elevation difference of 100 meters. So only the green one does. You can see here these are topographic profiles along these red, green, and blue lines. Only the green one fits the bill. And this is how we, for example, would identify a good pad area associated with uh, a habitat and a, uh, and a in a solar array area. Okay. Uh, and so finally, we're left with still a number of sites, about 25 candidate sites. Okay. And again, a site is a 2.5 kilometer circle around a point of maximum solar illumination. Uh, and about 24 are shown in this particular map, 20, the couple that are uh, off the chart here. So they're in the polar region, but a, a little too far actually to be. Uh, to fit here. Uh, and in any case, uh, how do we then narrow down these options? Well, the best ones among these will be the ones that give you the best, easiest access to water ice that is known to be inside some PSRs and or access to the South Pole Lake and Basin materials. Okay. Uh, and so the students last summer did a bit of traverse planning, but it was very notional. Uh, and you know, we we sort of were able to tell from which side roughly we would have access to South Pole Lincoln Basin material, like you can see on this on this double map. Uh, they actually looked at how much driving you would need to do to drive from each one of these sites, which are shown on the left column, to a the, the closest PSR, permanently shadowed region with water ice in it. And there are, in the first double column, you can see that there are slopes of less than 20 degrees or less than 10 degrees. What that means is that if you allow yourself to drive, if you have a rover that can handle slopes of up to 20 degrees, well, then your closest drive to a water ice rich, permanently shadowed region at the Shackleton Slater site, for example, is only 4.8 kilometers. But however, if your rover can't handle slopes of more than 10 degrees, uh, well, then you have to drive 6.7 kilometers to get to that same uh, water rich PSR. So that's what this table means. And then you can also look at the average distance to drive to other PSRs within the within the area. Okay. Uh, but in any case, the uh, Charlie and Aaron last summer, um, uh, in our work together, uh, we, we sort of concluded that there were three sites or three areas, three regions that floated to the top. Shackleton Slater Alpha, and I will let uh, Sophia and Cody talk to you a lot more about these. Uh, Mount Kosher, which is another interesting site. And uh, the third one, which I'm not showing here, but it's Shackleton der Gerlas Ridge. Now, these three sites, uh, if you notice, are all on the far side of the moon. The horizontal line that says 90 degrees west, 90 degrees east, that's the, that's the sort of the longitude uh, separating the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon. Okay, the Earth is up towards the top here. Uh, and yet, these places afford direct to Earth communications because they are high points. That's in fact why would they even see the sun uh, very well. Well, it turns out that they are also very good for, for science access. Uh, and so these three sites floated to the top last summer, but then you know, we had to look more carefully at where would we set up a base actually at these locations. And in some regions, there are several site options, which one of these sites might be the best. Uh, also, where would we drive to and which path would we take? So it gives me great pleasure and pride to introduce you now to Sophie English, who's a aerospace engineering major at uh, Texas A&M, and uh, Cody Johnson, who is a uh, undecided undergrad still at uh, Western Nevada College, but he might be decided by now <laughs> after this summer on the moon. Uh, and uh, Cody, I should point out, also is a U.S. Army veteran, and so uh, it was great to have him on the team as well for his experience with, with logistics and thinking about how to set up bases. Uh, so uh, I'll let them uh, give you the rest of this presentation and and flesh out these these three sites.
All right. Thank you, Pascal. Can you uh, unshare your screen for us so we can see sure. them? Yeah. Yay. Hello. OK, welcome, Sophie and Cody. Um, so good to have you guys here. Now that we kind of have a really basic understanding of what you guys are looking for and why, um, I understand, Sophie, you're going to talk to us a bit about the regional context of these sites and, and some of the research that you have done in trying to make a selection. So why don't you go ahead and, and give us that part of the talk? Awesome. Well, thank you guys for uh, having me and thank you, Pascal, for giving the great introduction. Um, however, I am going to take uh, a few steps back again just to reiterate what Pascal said. Um, so the Lunar South Pole is very unique in itself and filled with large impact craters and low solar angles. And so these large impact craters are what are seen in dark blue in this figure. Um, and they're what we call permanently shadowed regions or PSRs. And so because these craters are permanently shadowed and also because the moon has no atmosphere, uh, these regions are immensely cold. Um, some of these regions are actually the lowest temperatures in the solar system. Um, some craters go down to about negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so these regions, uh, PSRs, uh, are optimal for scientific interest due to the fact that they may contain water ice, uh, which Pascal touched upon uh, briefly before. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, there are other areas that are neither cold nor dark and receive constant illumination for over 200 days, similar to Earth's polar region like Devon Island. And so these red areas of high solar illumination are often at the tops of ridges and very high in elevation, which are very important to a solar powered base, um, which Cody will touch upon in a few minutes. Um, and so these high solar illumination uh, points uh, access uh, are very important for missions like Artemis III to potentially build a base. And so additionally, these same conditions happen with Earth's visibility. And so because we are approaching the far side of the moon on the lunar south pole, um, at some points the Earth is not visible and will thus create a problem in communications. Um, so the tops of ridges and areas of high elevation are ideal to efficiently to communicate with Earth at any given moment. Um, and another criteria that was selected uh, to look at in terms of building a base was the uh, surface roughness and slope. Um, so slope and roughness is also important in planning traverses, which I will touch upon more uh, later. Um, but it's also important to build a base. Um, and oftentimes, uh, slope, roughness, and go hand in hand. And so oftentimes, there could be a point of maximum illumination with a low slope. However, the region is very cratered and has a high roughness scale. And therefore, it's basically non-traversable. And so, for example, there was a site for the Constellation program that was considered called Malapert Mastiff, which had great illuminations on paper. It was visible to the Earth 100% of the time um, until you looked at the roughness. Um, and it was very cratered, uh, had a high roughness scale, and non-traversable. So after looking at these criteria, uh, we come up with the three uh, select candidate Artemis base camp sites. Um, there were 24 uh, preliminary sites, um, but upon further examination, um, again, the two RU students from last year, Charlie Willard and uh, Aaron Pimentel, identified the three best base camp regions, um, all with various sites within the region. And so each site is centered around a high illumination point. So these three regions is what Cody and I are focusing on this summer, and we'll take a closer look at what it potentially means to have a base at each of these sites. And each site has a solar illumination minimum of 65%, a minimum earth visibility of 50%, a minimum of a one kilometer square continuous flat terrain, so less than five degrees in slope, uh, proximity to a water ice bearing PSR, and an area for a rocket pad, which Dr. Lee touched upon. Um, so first off, uh, there's the Shackleton to Gerlash Ridge um, with three high illumination points, alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, each site is surrounded by 2.5 kilometer radius as the exploration zone. And the primary site of interest uh, in the Shackleton to Gerlache Ridge is the alpha point um, with a solar illumination percentage of greater than 85%. And so this uh, region has many great aspects to it, including a close proximity to PSR 107. Uh, it's a water bearing PSR that is approximately 10 kilometers away. Um, Additionally, this region is close to Shackleton Crater, like Dr. Lee mentioned. Uh, it was considered for the Constellation program um, and close to the South Pole for access. 
Um, there are also non, there are also a few non-water ice bearing PSRs for additional scientific, scientific points of interest. Um, the next uh, point is the Shackleton Slater region. Um, there are two potential sites, alpha and beta. The primary site of interest for us is Shackleton Slater Alpha, uh, and it has a illumination percentage of 77%. The water ice bearing PSR 112 is less than 10 kilometers away also, um, and even within the 2.5 kilometer radius of Shackleton Slater Beta. Shackleton Crater is still in proximity at about 15 kilometers away. Um, there are not many non-water bearing uh, PSRs close to alpha and beta for additional scientific research, um, but still within close proximity to PSR 116, or PSR 112, sorry. Um, and lastly is Mount Kosher. This was kind of a uh, speck in the dust that uh, was amazing to find. Um, it actually has five potential base camp sites, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. Uh, kosher beta, uh, is of the primary interest for us um, because it has a solar illumination of 77%. Um, excluding kosher delta, the four sites are less than 10 kilometers away from PSRs 132, 133, and 136. Additionally, there are 12 non-water ice bearing PSRs in proximity with a few inside of the 2.5 kilometer radius. Mount Kosher is rich in science return that is invaluable. Um, Additionally, the region is in proximity to the proxine bearing zone of the South Pole Aiken Basin, which uh, Dr. Lee touched upon. Um, and so I'm going to talk this more about uh, South Pole Aiken Basin and what it means to go from the uh, sites of high interest to the PSRs in a bit. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand it to Cody to talk about the logistics of how what it, build, what it means to build a base at each of these sites. All right. All right. Uh, Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Cody, you are going to talk about uh, the local base studies, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, take it All away. Right. Thank you very much. Go ahead and share. All right, can you see it okay? Perfect. Yep. So uh, I, I went ahead uh, for the presentation's sake, um, I went ahead and just focused on one particular high illumination point inside the Shackleton to Gerlash. Uh, 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 site. Um, and I went ahead and focused on the Shackleton to Gerlash Alpha high illumination point. And right here you can see is a pretty zoomed out uh, site map that's just for uh, terrain context. Um, and you've got, uh, as mentioned before, you got the two and a half kilometer uh, radius around the solar maximum point. Uh, from here, right in the middle, you've got a trail that goes all the way down to the pad area. Move this. Um, and the reason the pad area is all the way down there is uh, back to what Pascal was saying about you need at least 100 meters of elevation difference in between where you're going to be setting up the hab and the pad, or have some sort of uh, terrain feature that blocks any potential debris coming off of the pad when the rocket is landing or in the case of a crash so that you don't get any sort of uh, projectile debris hitting where you're trying to build a base because it's not great. <laughs> but um, I'll move on from here. Oop. There we go. Uh, this is the same map, and but we're looking at an overlay with slope. Uh, so the greener an area it is, the better it is for construction and then also setting up um, trails in between uh, where you need to go. Um, so anything that's within the green is around five degrees, which is perfect for construction. The yellow and the orange is still doable for traversing, um, but when you want to be traversing around areas inside your actual camp, you would prefer the slope to be about 10 degrees or less. Moving on, we're going to look at uh, site roughness of the same area. Um, so the darker an area is, uh, the smoother it is, the less rough it is, which is also important for terrain, navigation, and construction. And then from here, uh, the red box that you see around the solar maximum area is where we're going to be heading to next, and I'll go ahead and zoom into that. And this is what it looks like with the high-resolution 
uh, narrow angle camera that's on the lunar orbiter. Um, so you get to see what the terrain looks like. There's for the South Pole, there's still quite a bit of craters compared to the Mare areas that Apollo was looking at. Um, but right smack dab in the middle, you've got again your solar max, and then to the bottom right of that, you've got the Hab area. And then the there are three pretty important constraints when it comes to the consideration of construction. Whereas when you're talking about traversals to PSRs and regions of interest, with Sophie's talk, she said the slope and the roughness go hand in hand when it comes to traversals. But when it comes to construction, it's actually the slope and the solar illumination that go hand in hand. Uh, and the roughness kind of takes a back seat almost. It's still important, but it's, it's more important that you have an ideal slope paired with an ideal solar illumination. So what we're looking at here is some solar illumination surrounding the solar maximum area, which are the two blue pixels right in the middle there. Uh, so down to the bottom left, you got the legend. And we started at 50% because you want at least 50% solar illumination for where you're building. Um, the areas surrounding the, I'm sorry, the, uh, so you've got the solar array set up right in the middle of the two brightest pixels, um, because that's where you're going to be generating the most energy from your solar panels. And the solar array itself doesn't necessarily have to be a square as shown here, but you do need uh, square footage wise, you need about 50 by 50 meters uh, of solar panel coverage in order to be able to reach uh, an estimated peak 400 kilowatt uh, generation. Uh, for being able to fully power your base and everything that you need. Uh, moving on from solar illumination, you've got DTE, which is direct to earth visibility. Uh, so anything that is colored in this region, you're able to see the earth from uh, great, more than 50% of the time average. Um, and then from here, this is what decides where you put your communication setup. Um, and there's, when I move, when I move on to the next slide here, this is slope and where the hab is going to be constructed. You'll notice that the comms are a little bit further away from the hab area. Uh, an important thing to note about the comms is the actual camp that you set up is going to have a lot of RF interference, which might disrupt uh, potential communications. So you want your communications far enough away from your hab to where you're not going to have to worry that much about the interference, but you also want to be able to get there to and from it in case you need to do maintenance on it. Uh, and the same with the solar array. Uh, the solar array shouldn't be too far from your hab, but just far enough to where any dust that might get kicked up by traversing around your base doesn't uh, land on the solar panels and lower their generation rate. Um, but right in here, you can see the hab is set up in an area that's relatively smooth uh, and flat, giving the surrounding area. And going back to what I said about the slope and the solar illumination going hand in hand, if you look down here to the bottom left, that was an initial guess as to where you would put the hab, because if you look at it, it is really, really low in slope, and it's a perfect sized area to fit uh, the hab. Uh, which on a side note for the HAB here, I'm using the Houghton Mars project base just as a reference to be able to get a sense of scale. Um, oh, excuse me. And so down here was where we were originally thinking of putting it. But if you go back a couple of slides to the solar illumination, that entire area, which is perfect slope wise for constructing a base, does not have greater than 50% solar illumination. So it wouldn't be ideal uh, because then you'd have to, you would have to worry about uh, low temperatures and using more energy than you would necessarily need just to keep the base warm and not too cold. Uh, but going back to where we ended up changing it right here, you actually have greater than 50%. You have to have around 60% solar illumination, which is perfect. So we ended up shifting it over here uh, moving on from here, using just slope uh, as a constraint for traverse planning, 
I went ahead and roughly set up some trails to and from the base camp, the solar array, the communication setup, and then all the way down there, which will be hooked up to the main trail that Sophie uh, came up with, which she'll talk about later, all the way down to the pad area. And that would be the main trail to and from the pad and the hab for logistics. And then moving on from here, after you put all of those constraints into effect, you end up with a rough estimation of what a potential base camp would look like at one of these candidate sites. Uh, moving on from here, we can look at the actual pad area, which if you uh, saw on the first slide was more to the bottom left. Um, you, for the pad itself, you would want roughly 100 by 100 meter area for safe landing and takeoff. And then when it comes to constraints on the pad area, you really have to worry about slope because you're not gonna be setting up comms down there. You're not gonna be setting up solar panels down there. All you really need to worry about is slope. But at the same time, this is what the solar illumination would look like down there. So you at least have greater than 50% solar illumination on where you're going to be landing uh, and taking off your uh, landers uh, and cargo rockets and stuff. Um, so at least you wouldn't have to worry damage sensitive. Um, and then here is, again, not as important, but it still has uh, some direct to earth capabilities. Unfortunately for this particular site, you can't get uh, up to 50% uh, direct to earth visibility. It, it's so the scale changed for this particular site down to 25. So what you're looking at for the pad is right 28, 26% of the time uh, direct to earth, which isn't as good, but again, it's not that important because your actual communications will be set up closer to base in a much uh, higher DTE area. Uh, and then here is the most important constraint for the pad, which is slope. And it's smack in the middle of a nice smooth uh, area that can be um, used pretty confidently uh, for rocket operations. And then once you remove all the overlays, you're just left with terrain. Um, and then that's, that's pretty much all I've got. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back over to Sophie to talk more about the traverses to and from the potential HABs and the PSRs. So thank you. Thank you, Cody. Uh, go ahead and stop sharing. Okay. And we'll bring so we'll bring Sophie back in. Sophie, uh, so you're going to talk to us about how to get around and find things and actually do science and, and on the moon. So let's go ahead and, and start that off. Sorry, I had myself muted. Thank you, uh, Beth, uh, once again. So um, revisiting the uh, water ice bearing permanently shadowed regions. Um, these are very cold regions on the lunar south pole. And because of this, they are so cold, some of the PSRs contain surface exposed water ice. And so just in this picture, there are around 169 identified water ice bearing PSRs um, that were detected by uh, India's M3. And so each identified PSR has at least one detection of a surface exposed wa water ice molecule. Um, so going back to the hydrogen uh, identified, um, this uh, means that there is water ice exposure. And so these detections of water ice will help the Artemis missions with ISRU and create a pathway for more deep space exploration. And so actually NASA will send a rover called Viper that will land a Nobile crater up in the upper right hand side of the right figure um, to actually sample the water ice before going to the Artemis, before the Artemis 3 mission. And so these areas are of high priority um, to traverse into. And so my research this summer is primarily focused on what it means to go from each candidate site to a PSR. Um, another important scientific region of interest is the South Pole Aiken Basin or SPA B. Um, so SPA is the largest impact basin on the moon. Um, it has a diameter of about 4,000 kilometers. Um, it's also believed by NASA that the basin is around 3.9 billion years old. Uh, so our Mount Kosher site uh, is so all of our sites are shown in the stars, um, but specifically our Mount Kosher site is shown um, actually within the proxy bearing zone of SPA, um, which is very important. Um, 
And so the proxene bearing zone is rich with minerals such as iron and magnesium and serves as a high target for samples. Um, so to take a look, closer look at uh, uh, preliminary traverses, um, I have a few example traverses to show. Um, this specific traverse shows our high, highest illumination site, Shackleton de Grelash Alpha, from which we saw from Cody, um, to a water detection within the water ice bearing PSR 107. And to explain a little bit more about what went into the mapping of each traverse, I used a GIS Python analysis called a least cost path. And so the least cost path is a distance analysis tool uh, within a GIS software that creates a path between two points, um, determining the most cost effective route. Uh, now, in terms of the criteria I looked at, in terms of slope, uh, the Apollo rover LOV could not handle going over slopes that were 20 degrees. So for the Artemis mission, um, for, for my uh, traverses, I stuck with uh, traversing on areas that are less than 20 degrees. Um, and yeah, so the next criteria I considered is roughness. Um, when comparing the image on the right to this uh, uh, to a uh, visible image on the left, um, you can see that these uh, high roughness areas are these uh, lower cratered regions. Um, so I stuck with around less than three uh, REMS meters to traverse between uh, because they have a relatively low roughness level uh, to effectively traverse to and from uh, sites to the uh, PSRs. Um, and lastly, I prioritize solar illumination and direct to earth visibility, prioritizing areas that are over 50% illuminated. Um, another, part, part, another important aspect uh, to my analysis are the entry points. Uh, you may notice I have two entry points shown on the rim of PSR 107. And these, these points were chosen uh, primarily because they are about, uh, about a kilometer away from an area that is relatively illuminated. So when you're exploring the inside of a PSR, um, the astronauts will probably get relatively cold fairly quickly. So it's important to consider entry points that are a short distance away um, from any illumination as a quick way to turn around if things may go sideways. And going back to this uh, specific traverse, um, again, this is from Shackleton to Gerlache Alpha to uh, entry points one and two. Um, Going from Shackleton de Grelache Alpha to entry point one is about a seven kilometer traverse one way, um, while going to entry point two is about a nine kilometer traverse going one way. Uh, both of these traverses are actually under 15 degrees and two RMS uh, meters uh, to provide a uh, better understanding of the uh, roughness and slope levels of Shackleton de Grelache. Um, the next traverse I'm going to show is Shackleton Slater Alpha to PSR 112. Um, PSR 112 also has two entry points that are less than five degrees in slope um, and less than one RMS meters. Um, and they're also uh, one kilometer away from a high point of illumination. So going from Shackleton's later alpha to entry point two is approximately 11 kilometers. Um, and going from alpha to entry point one is about five kilometers away. Um, so for this traverse, I've focused on slopes less than 20 degrees with a roughness level than three RMS meters. Um, and lastly, um, the last traverse I have to show is uh, Mount Kosher Epsilon to PSR 132 and the SPA proxene bearing zone. So uh, what I showed before of the proxene bearing zone uh, with uh, points of high iron and magnesium, um, this is the boundary between the two. Um, it's relatively close. Um, this specific traverse is about 10 meters long, um, 10 kilometers long, my bad. Um, and uh, planning traverses, uh, may I mention, uh, around Mount Kosher has been somewhat difficult uh, in terms of data. So when you look at a roughness map on the right-hand side, um, you can actually see where the LRO flew over in relation to Mount Kosher. So uh, because the data is somewhat limited, the traverses have been also at a very preliminary stage in terms of planning. Um, however, the same criteria applies for entry points and the slopes with the data provided. And so uh, going back to this specific traverse, um, you go over slopes that are less than 20 degrees and try to uh, stay under less than three RMS meters based on the data available. So my specific next steps 
Um, I'm going to continue to identify the scientific targets and interests for the other uh, water terrain classes, uh, boulders, fresh craters, and the Tycho Ray insects. Uh, I also want to estimate driving times based on the Apollo LRV. Um, additionally, I would like to model the solar illumination in two hour time intervals. Um, specifically, I would uh, like to use a program called NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio, in addition to the Explosion Ground Data System. I actually found both of those programs uh, a few days ago, actually, um, that I will implement my data into. And uh, finally, as time moves along, uh, we may not get to it at the end of this summer, um, but we definitely need to require more LRO um, and uh, LOLA data, especially for Mount Kosher. Um, it may not happen at the end of the summer, but hoping for it nonetheless. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sophie. Um, fabulous presentation. All right, Pascal, it is, we've been at this for a little bit. So uh, tell us what the next steps are and uh, give us kind of a quick summary so we yeah. can wrap up here. So first of all, once again, these are preliminary results. I mean, this is a sort of a practice run in some sense for, for uh, our students this year. Uh, we all actually spoke a few typos here and there, including me. Uh, so, you know, uh, work in progress until it's written. You know, it's not really uh, uh, recorded uh, properly. Uh, but uh, the point, though, is that uh, this illustrates how challenging it is going to be for us to sort of pick a site on the moon that meets all these criteria. I mean, we want to be near the South Pole, you know, in general near the water. We want the place to be safe to land at, but we want power there in the first place. And then it has to, we have to see the earth a little bit. We want the place to be a, not just flat for habitat, but large enough and continuous so that you can expand the hab area over time. Uh, we want the, the trails that take you between the airport, so to speak, and the habitat and town. Uh, okay. <laughs> you want that trail to be, you know, over slopes, the, across slopes that are not too bad, but also terrain that's not too rough. And in many of these cases, we actually don't quite have the data yet that we need at full resolution to to really make a, a proper, you know, town planning type of uh, assessment. So this is this is just to 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 get ourselves excited, I guess, for for the next step, which is to acquire more data, uh, higher resolution data. Mount Kosha in particular is is a lot less covered than uh, as I think Sophie was pointing out than uh, Shackleton de Gerlash and Shackleton Slater, for example. And other people, of course, have proposed other sites. Uh, and, you know, nobody is saying here that those sites don't have merit. I mean, again, this is, with the criteria we apply, this is, these are the sites that are sort of now floating to the top. But uh, any one of these could be dinged, uh, you know, by just one criterion that's important that's not met. Mount Kosher, for example, as as spectacular as the place is, I mean, it's a, it's like a, you know, all these sites are on a butte, essentially over the, you know, the, the, the basins around them, around it. Uh, Mount Kosher has spectacular views all around it. You can see the earth, you can, you can see, you know, the sun is up there at the top, but then the terrain is really rough on it. It's very, it's probably a very old chunk of, you know, mega block that was ejected as part of the South Pelican Basin, possibly. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and, and so it would have been sitting at the lunar surface for a long, long time and then is really beat up by craters. The terrain could be super rough, you know, and so just because the, it's, it's a nice location doesn't make it, you know, a good place to set up shop. So this is work in progress. That's the first thing you understand. We need more data. Uh, these two students who are, as you can probably tell, are super bright, are going to continue working on this this summer, uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, at, at more variants of what they're proposing, uh, also at other sites. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will progressively converge and narrow things down to, you know, uh, uh, some really good options. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today and talking about this amazing science. The Artemis mission, of course, is, is a, a huge undertaking, and I think you all are doing some very great work on making that happen. So thank you um, to all of you for joining me today. You. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having us.
Absolutely. As always, our SETI Lives are an outreach project at the SETI Institute, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the search for and understanding of life beyond Earth. If you would like to support our outreach program, remember that um, your Facebook stars, your YouTube super chats, and uh, just going to SETI.org and clicking on that donate button, those help us continue to bring all of this amazing science to you. So thank you once again for watching and remember to tell us where you are watching from and feel free to post some questions in our comments. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.